All right, today we're going to do a technical analysis of Wolfgang Schmidt. Now, this is going to be a little bit different compared to most technical analysis that I would do or you'll see on YouTube. As you can see, I've got four separate views. I've synced them all up together so that we can see this in more of a balanced way so that things make a little bit more sense. And there's a lot of confusion about how Wolfgang does things. I just wanted to clear some things up, some things I've learned. I don't know everything, but I will be going through everything I do know. So, let's go ahead and just watch it real quick. It's not perfectly synced up, but it is well synced up. Okay, so, first up, we're in the wind-up. So the discus is shoulder height for, I know you can't see it on that one, but you can see it here, for every throw. The reason that is is because after going through the entire throw, you're going to end up at shoulder height at the release as well. So this just sets up the pattern of the throw well. Having it up this high also creates a nice high and low point. So one of the things I'd like you to look at is his left arm. You'll notice his left arm is low. Now the reason that is is because when you create a low left arm it will help set up a good orbit and create well balanced action out of the back of the circle. You'll notice that there's no major shifting. He's staying nice and level and it creates a good low point at the back that will set up a nice high point and create the rhythm of the discus path. It will ellipticate and pendulate because of that. So speaking of the shoulders, I'd like you to look, I think this is a best view, right there at his right shoulder. You'll notice it's not internally rotated, so that would be thumb way down if you would put that as far internal as possible like you're trying to put your thumb behind you and down that's internal rotation if you go all the way up that's external rotation he's just about externally rotated to neutral this will create a good 90 degrees between the discus and your torso now this isn't perfect But you'll see it, this creates a nice degree of radius from the body and the discus. This also makes it so that the discus won't just drop and stay too low throughout the throw. And it'll keep it far back as well. If you have the discus too low, it will have a tendency to shorten that radius. And then you're shortening the path that the discus takes. And you want to have the longest path of the discus possible during your throw so that you can accelerate that through that longest path and that creates farther distance. Now let's go ahead and take a look at his stance. Now if you look at this one right here you can see how far apart his feet are. He spreads his feet a little bit wider than shoulder width and this is good because when you do this it allows you to sit more as he's coming into the South African position when he sits his hips back and down. So it's kind of a squat onto your left leg is what's going to happen. And if you have your legs wider, you can sit deeper depending on how you're built. This also will help facilitate a longer radius with that right leg around the left side. Now let's go ahead and look again. I know we're spending a lot of time at the back of the circle, but that's important. So if you look at his left foot here on each of these views, you can see that he is on his big toe. Now most of his weight's on his right leg, but he's still on the big toe of his left foot. And that will create the ability to turn with that left heel and kick it out and around. And that is what will initiate the movement out of the back of the circle. It isn't an upper body unwinding. The upper body doesn't lead the back of the circle. It's the feet, and specifically 
the left foot that pulls the body in through what I would like to refer as a basketball pivot. So if you've never played basketball, what happens is that if you stop dribbling and you pick up the ball, you can choose one foot to pivot on. And in our case, it would if for a right-handed thrower, it would be your left foot. Now when you pivot on it, you swing the entire body around it. So you watch the whole body is basically hinging or swinging, pivoting around the left side. It's not running ahead with the upper body it's pivoting the whole body from the windup he's holding the windup and just swinging himself around his left side by pulling himself around with that left heel you watch all the left heels it's pulling him around now this is a good time to mention what X is so X is separation between shoulder and hip if you look at the beginning He's setting up the maximal distance between shoulder and hip. So his shoulder line's here, and his hip line is here. Over from a top view, I don't have one, but a top view would look like this. And the discus back here. And here's his left shoulder, here's his right hip, and his left hip. So when you do that, that creates torque. That creates separation of upper body and lower body. And it's necessary to hold this throughout the entire throw so that you can have a smooth acceleration and create as much stretch reflex at the finish. And because of the nature of the implement that's not, not attached to your neck, you can't unwind all the way. If you would unwind all the way, you would then have to have the discus pause in its acceleration and its path through the throw, and that would slow down and hurt your distance. Unlike the shot where you'll see people like Adam Nelson or more recently Tom Walsh where the whole upper body will lead out of the back create this big stretch reflex on the legs and then wrap back up in the middle you can't do that in the discus because of how herky-jerky the movement is and it'll mess up the pattern of the throw it'll create a high point at the wrong point your upper body will have to stall and that will basically ruin any sort of inertia you've built up out of the back. So the best way to do it is just to hold X from the beginning. And Wolfgang does it the best out of just about anybody. I'd say Nicholas Alekna is the best currently. And then Christian Che. Those are the top two guys and the top two that are best at holding X. Wolfgang was really light years ahead of almost everybody else in that regard. Now, during this first turn out of the back, when this right foot picks up, it's not turning. The right foot does not turn, it doesn't work, and it's leading with the inside of the thigh, the inside of the right thigh. Now, when you do this, what you'll do is you'll create a stretch across the groin muscles and you'll also create a nice wide right leg sweep that will allow you to pull yourself through the throw with the right leg. And this is important for this style of throw that you do this. If you leave the if you turn the feet together, the upper body has a tendency to get ahead whereas this allows you to feel the separation and actually have your lower body lead. This is that right foot leading the throw motion. This is what so many of the great discus throwers have talked about, is that the right foot will actually lead the throw through the circle and it's pulling you around. That's something Mike Bunsick talked about. I posted a video of his explaining that topic. This is how you do it. You can't have it actually turn it's got to stay an external rotation leading with the inside of the thigh. If you'll notice, at this point, if you look at these two views, his knees are both pointed out at about 30-ish degrees, kind of the way, and his toes, kind of the way you would squat. Now, if you keep your knees out, that's how you lead with the inside of the thigh. So, with that... Let's go ahead and look at 
the balance. So, this is almost perfect. I didn't intend this. This is just me not being able to edit it perfectly when syncing these videos. If you'll look at this one and this one, they're at different positions, but it's important to note. Mac Wilkins is always talking about get the left shoulder over the left knee. So, he has that. But why does he have that? Well, the reason he has that is because of over here, he set it up so that uh, as his hips go back, his chest has to come forward. It's just the way you squat. Any amount of hip flexion has to have body lean in order to maintain balance. So this body lean, while maintaining X, appears and is an, sort of an optical illusion that the upper body almost looks like it's getting ahead, but it's not. It's not actually just over the left knee. It's not trying to get over the left knee. It was already here to begin with. By holding this particular right here, by holding that, you can actually stay balanced and just pivot around the left. That's where this whole nine o'clock drop thing comes into play. Now, speaking of that, you can see right here, this is low point. This is the maximum lowest point of the orbit. And if you look at this version right here, you can see that his lower body is leading and his upper body hasn't unwinded at all. It looks just like that position I just showed you a few moments ago here, but later in the throw, because all he's doing is hinging around his left. He's not opening with the upper body. He's leading with the legs, making the feet do the work. He's specifically pulled himself around with the left heel, and now, because of that motion of the right leg, it will help him to be pulled through the circle. Now, if we go back just a little bit to this point, you'll see what is often talked about is this knee drop. The knee drops to the middle, straight down, basically the center of the sector. Some throwers will get it down here. Some throwers can't, and they're actually pointing down the right sector. Either way, it has to be within this direction for you to be able to get across the circle. If it doesn't turn at all, you're cutting yourself off and you won't be able to create as much power. Now, some people have criticized and said that if you don't unwind the upper body, if you don't use that left arm, you won't be able to get turned. This isn't true. The way you get turned is not because of the upper body and I just proved it. You turn because of the left foot, because of the sitting of the hips down. Watch his hips. They all sink together. They all lower down, just like in a squat, onto his left foot as he's kicking around with that left heel. The right foot's just swinging around the side, just like on a hinge, pivoting around the left side. That's how you get out of the back of the circle. It's not that complicated. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it isn't that complicated. It's also not a miracle, and it's not because he's just a freak athlete. It's because he knows what he's doing. Now, at this point, you'll note that the upper body leans just slightly ahead. That creates the imbalance. That creates that shift that allows him to create momentum across the circle. His left thigh is vertical, and his left knee is now at the lowest point. It's probably going to... No, it's not probably. It's going to be. That's maximal dip. Now that creates the angular momentum to actually get across the circle. Now the right leg sweep. I talked earlier you don't actually turn the right leg. Well here's where this comes into play. It's going to pull him through the circle. He's not turning, he's pivoting around it. Think of it like this. There's basically a pole running through him right there. And he's just swinging around it. He's not working his right leg necessarily. He's working his hips around his axis of rotation, which is his spine. So if your axis of rotation is your spine and he's just swinging his hips around, that's how he gets turned through the middle of the circle. 
the momentum of the right leg sweep plus the drop into the center creates this kind of grapevine skipping like motion across the circle where he floats almost now obviously he doesn't really float if you watch his hip level here I'll just draw a little thing right there it's not rising super much it's not jumping up super high in the air now obviously he's driving his right knee high that's what was necessary because of the sweep he had out of the back of the circle but as he's coming in he's not jumping high he's not pushing with his left knee he's pushing with his ankle and his hip that's what's going to dri drive him out of the back of the circle so that he's not creating an anchor point with his left side now here's something else to watch is his right foot look at the level of his right foot so I'm going to draw a line here at his right foot level and you'll notice it's not going to creep above it his hips might appear to rise a little bit but his right foot isn't actually going any higher he's not throwing it up in the air his knee does drive up a little bit but what happens is he brings that heel behind his knee not as much as someone for instance Jay Sylvester or uh, Mac Wilkins did but it's still happening he's not extending he's not just swing kicking with his right leg now again with this drive out of the back I talked about being balanced the illusion of the left arm over left knee now let's talk about this whole jackknife thing I've heard some people that hate this and I didn't understand it so I just agreed with them before I don't anymore and the reason is because as I stated earlier your shoulders have to be over your knees the more you sit down and if you have a wider right leg sweep you're gonna sit down more and it's gonna appear to create this jackknife position it's not a problem it means you're in good balance so as he's coming across the circle his right foot appears to have pre-turned before it lands but as I just mentioned before it's just because of the momentum he swung himself around think of it kinda of like a grapevine karaoke step that kind of warm-up drill you would do for any kind of general sports warm-up that's what's happening right now he's doing a crossover he's not actually turning into himself many throwers will get caught and turn their right leg into their left and now their left legs all the way stuck at the back of the circle and their right legs almost down and this happens this was something that Al Order used to do and he managed to still throw far but that doesn't mean it was technically correct and the reason it's not technically correct is because what will happen is that left foot will get left behind and typically Al didn't do this because he was so flexible the upper body will get ahead of the lower body now Al managed to wrap up so tightly with his upper body that it didn't affect him as much but it still created a hitch in the throw and probably limit him, limited him by several meters so as this left foot is leaving the back of the circle you'll see that his shoulders are basically level now many throwers today will stay a lot more level than he does he will he will almost immediately start to lower his left shoulder and let his right shoulder pop up and this will have the high point of his discus be almost in line or where he's going to throw wherever the high point is is the direction of the throw so if you're throwing over to the right it's because your high point came too early if you're throwing far over to the left it's because it came too late so that's a good marker for you whenever you're analyzing your own throws so his left arm is low and it pauses or at least it appears to pause now you'll notice something familiar about this what does this look right like, look like right here this position well it looks just like he did at the beginning in the windup see he's just holding the windup and hinging himself around and he's back in it again as he's crossing over his left foot's getting pulled to the front of the circle he's holding the upper body back 
his left arm is low again. Remember, I mentioned that at the beginning. The left arm being low sets up the proper orbit. So when you've got the low left arm, now exceedingly low, then you're shortening your radius, you're going to throw it too high. There's a balance. You'll be able to figure that out. Remember, a good throw is always at 33, 36 degrees or something like that. I know John Powell says, you know, if it looks like a line drive, that's better than if it just kind of floats up there. It's a lot better if it just goes straight up and then straight back down. Now, I kind of forgot to mention this, but right here is where he finds his focal point. He saw it here. Whoops. He saw it here. He's picking his focal point here, and that's going to be at about 10 o'clock. So somewhere right about there. Right about here. And really right about here, nearest to the camera for that angle. So he's found it. Now he's going to twist, swing around. He finds it again, and he's going to keep his eyes on it the whole time. He's going to hold his shoulders back. He's still looking at it. You can really see it in this one. I know his face is dark. It's not really that easy to tell, but you can see where his shoulders are. You can see his chest is still facing that focal point as his left foot is coming down now the more you can do that the better because when this left foot lands the best position is when the discus is 180 degrees back and it looks like you're forming a T with your body all right so I forgot to mention this but I wanted to point it out real quick where the discus is pointing in this position is where the focal point is so your eye should be on the focal point way back there when the discus is 180 degrees from the release. That's where your focal point should be, and it should line up together. When you land, your eye should still be on it. If the discus is 180 degrees back from the release point, you're going to throw very, very far. And this is very, very hard to do, though very simple, if you can just control your eyes and your head enough. Wolfgang was exceedingly patient with his head and his upper body. He's not peeking over his shoulder. You can see this the whole time. He doesn't peek at all. You can't even see his face until that right foot starts to work. Now, speaking of that left and right foot, the left foot for him, and I believe for most throwers, should land on a flat left foot. That way, you create the most stable position for you to block off of. Now, when this left foot lands, when it, the moment it touches down is when the right foot actually begins to turn. I hope you can see my square, scare quotes through the screen. This is when it actively begins to rotate into the left thigh. It rotates forward. This is where we're finally starting to work it. Before, it was just pivoting, hinging around. You're hinging around that right foot. Now, it's working. And when it works, it kicks the right heel out, and the right knee drops down, and the thighs smash together. And right there is when the right foot has completely turned into the left, right about there. And now he will begin to push. Discus is as far back as he can get it. Mac Wilkins would like to force it back. I don't know that Wolfgang did that. I don't think he did, based on what I see. He's just maintaining that angle between his torso and the discus, maintaining maximal distance. He's not really forcing it back. He's just holding X. And then when he rotates, finally, as soon as he finishes rotating, now he pushes. Now he extends. And when he extends, it ends up appearing to happen after the release. Though he, as you can see, is pushing while he's releasing. See, he already finished rotating. He's just pushing here. He's just pushing through now. And then he has what... I picked up this term from Newt Helgentnes. I'm sorry if I butchered that name. But he has what is called a delayed reverse finish. Because he finished the right foot turn, and then he pushes with the legs. And he blocks, 
Everything stops. His left arm has started to actually unwind here. When the left foot lands, it actually starts to unwind. It pulls, it starts to shorten, it bends, and then it locks in at his side. And with in unison, with the left leg block, allows the right arm to rip across the chest. And here, it's not until that left foot lands that X is lost. And he's still trying to hold it back. He's still trying to keep that right shoulder behind his right hip as long as he can to get the longest pull and the most amount of stretch reflex into the discus. Now, I heard this in an, I, an old IAF, International Athletics Federation. They had a technical analysis that I've also reposted of Wolfgang Schmidt at the 1978 European Championships. And they mentioned the movement of the pelvis is not so much forward as it is rotary. Now, if you look, and they said along the body axis, rotary along the body axis, which, as I mentioned before, is the spine. So, you can see he's still maintaining that lean back, and he's just rotating around that axis. Obviously, he comes forward a bit. You have to come forward. He had so much momentum coming out of the back of the circle, but that's not his... That's not what's in his mind. And because of that, it creates this bow across the entire body from shoulder to toe. is backward C. This is what coaches mean when they talk about the backward C. Everything is created a giant stretch reflex through the hips, through the thigh, through the toes, into the shoulder. And all of this is what creates this enormous stretch reflex into the release. Now unfortunately some of these videos don't sync properly so can't see exactly but you can see arm rips across here. It's all facing forward. Now real quick I forgot to mention this. I want to talk about this left foot so let's go ahead and look at these two. Look at the feet. And look specifically at the left foot. It's not coming across high. Now, if you come across too high, it'll take forever to get down. Some people, like Gerd Cantor, it, it appears to be high, but it's really working in unison with the right leg, and it gets down quick. That's not what I'm talking about. The high left foot is when that knee is too high. Look at his left knee. The left knee dictates where the left foot's going to go, and he's not driving, he's not kicking his left knee up back high. And because of that, it can plant quickly with the left foot. So that's just something to think about as well. I wanted to mention that too. So I hope you guys got a lot out of that. If you have any questions, go ahead, write a comment. If you want to get coaching from me or a technical analysis, you can go ahead and click the link in the description. And go to my website. The uh, it's good Goody Gym, Good Gym G U D E G Y M dot com, and you can go ahead and order a technical analysis. You can get throws coaching, throws coaching, and lifting coaching, or just lifting coaching. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you. I hope you got a lot out of this.